want to give you a little uh, heads up on this morning uh, on what, what's going to take place in the next few minutes. As I refer to scriptures, uh, this morning is going to be a morning of involvement, participation. And most Sundays are around here, but uh, this morning even more so. So if you're visiting this morning, we want you to feel as comfortable as possible to just know in advance that you're probably going to participate and uh, you don't have to have one eye on the door now. You know, we, we want you here. This is, this is okay. And uh, we want to, we always want to, but this morning a specific aspect of what it is to be a believer and one of the ways that we minister to one another that we are called to by a precedence of Scripture, modeled to us even by Jesus and disciples and apostles and the early church. And um, I want us to, to look at this this morning. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit about prayer. And then we're going to go into a time of praise and worship. And I'll give you some instruction of what's going to happen during that time. So in, J- in John chapter 17, in that chapter, um, we catch Jesus doing something that wasn't unusual It's just that um, in that chapter, we find out what he's praying about and who he's praying about. You know, many um, passages just say Jesus went up um, to pray, or he spent the night in prayer uh, seeking his father, and then he comes down in the morning from the mountain or wherever he was praying. And then he goes about his day and ministering to people, etc., and walking with his disciples. And so, um, you know, we know that Jesus prayed and prayed a lot, talked with his father a lot. And it's interesting in John chapter 17 because now it gives us a little bit of insight of what Jesus is saying. What's he talking to his father about? And we discover in that chapter on this occasion, that Jesus was talking to the Father about his disciples. He was praying for his disciples. And then in addition to that, Jesus branches out beyond just the group of disciples that he was praying for. He was also praying for all the people who would put faith in in him and listen to the proclamation of the good news of the gospel that comes through his disciples who become apostles and the people um, who believe in what they say and proclaim about him and put faith in Christ. And then from there, the people who continue to carry that testimony and through generation after generation, people who proclaim Christ as the Savior, that they would believe and become one and unified and And so now through time, that prayer in John 17 was about his specific disciples that have names, and then about believers at large through time, all the way to today. John chapter 17, without stretching it, without elaborate, you know, stretching the scripture or taking it out of context, in John 17, he's actually praying even about you and I in this room. Turn to the person next to you and say, Jesus has prayed for you. Uh Uh-huh. I mean, Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior, has prayed for you. I mean, you know, I'm grateful for prayer and for people praying for me. Strangers who've come up that I don't know in a service or whatever, they want to pray for me, or somebody sends a message I don't know well, prays for me, and I'm grateful for all of that. People I know who pray for me, and and then, you know, there's people who I know just have this really unique, you know, walk with the Lord and closeness, and man, I really want them praying for me, and 
you know. I do. I mean, it's not out of a selfish thing. It's just, yeah, I, I need prayer, and I know me, you know. And uh, I want the Spirit to, you know, conquer my flesh, and I want to cooperate, and I want the Lord's will to be done in my life and lead me into my days and all of that. And, uh, you know, man, I really want them praying for me. But if we keep going, you know, up the ladder, so to speak, Jesus? Oh, yeah, I'll take his prayers, right? You know, he's not entangled with flesh and imperfection. And so take encouragement today, regardless of what your history's been, regardless of what's going on in your life, regardless of your resume, whether you think it's pretty good or not so great or whatever. Listen, Jesus has prayed for you. In John 17, he prays for his disciples and then all those who put faith in him that hear the message through time. In Luke 22, this is Jesus meeting with his disciples and he's about to go to his hour of, you know, testing, trial, on to crucifixion. And he's talking with his disciples and he indicates that there is one among them who will betray him and there's also one among them that will deny him. And, you know, Peter speaks up about, I will never do that. And Jesus turns to Peter and says to him, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And then he says something interesting to him. He says, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And here's the important phrase. Jesus says to him, but Simon, I have prayed for you. I've prayed for you. Jesus prays for Simon by name. It's not just a prayer for the disciples in general. It's not just a prayer for all those who are to come in time to the current day and, and beyond us as God gives time. Those prayers are good. There are times I pray for you as individuals. There are times that I pray for, for you as collectively as the living church. There's days I, I pray for him to just watch over your life, for him to use you that day, for you to, for you to be strengthened by his spirit and whatever you're facing. And so there's times I just pray in general for all of you, and there's times I pray by name. This is an occasion where we find out that Jesus knew what Peter was about to go through, and Jesus prays for him in advance. How wonderful, think about that, how wonderful that would be for God's Spirit to speak to someone in your life to pray for you in advance of what they're not sure maybe, what you're about to go through. You may not be sure, you might be in it. And God puts on their heart to pray for you. And they come to you and say, listen, I don't know what all's going on, I don't know what you're about to go through, and I'm not prophesying doomsday, but I want you to know that I have prayed for you. See, it says a lot of things, but one of the things that it says is that God is with you, knows in advance, and has set somebody up to be praying for you. It means you're on God's mind. It means that you're on his heart. What encouragement can you and I take for somebody saying, you know what? I've prayed for you. I'm praying for you. You're about to, we know that you're about to go into surgery. I, I, we've been praying for you. I've been praying for you. I know that you are going into a very important meeting at work and you don't know how this is going to play out. I want you to know that I've prayed for you. Somebody comes to you, I've prayed for you. I know that you're going to be meeting with um, uh, someone you've had conflict with. You've shared that with me. I want you to know that I'm praying for you. That there's prayer going in advance of the arrival of that next encounter in life. That God cares. That God has uh, a place to include us to partner in seeking the blessing on behalf of someone else. See, the Lord cares about your life. 
If life's been a bummer for you, I don't want you to look at that and measure God according to that. Good times are bad, difficult or easy. No matter how long the seasons of either, or they come and go, I want you to know that God cares for you. And he's been interceding for you. And Jesus said, it says that he's at the right hand of the Father ever interceding for us. Interceding, being the go-between, between between us and God, and made a way that you and I can go directly to God. He's made a way for us. And he wants to use you to seek him for a blessing for someone else's benefit, not just your own. And that there's people out here that can seek God for blessing into your life, for God to carry out his plan and purpose. See, God's made this so beautifully that we can be a part of what God is doing in someone else's life without having to be a busybody about all the details. That was just a side note. Turn to the person next to you and say, that was a really good side note. (laughs) Jesus says to Peter, I've prayed for you. The Apostle Paul... He writes a letter to the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus, and uh, verse 15 through 19, it's one of the places where, where Paul says, I have prayed for you. So here's Jesus, the Son of God, who prays to his Father, talks with his Father, and we find out that he prays for specific people, and he prays for people, a group of people, or people in general who will become believers. Here's the Apostle Paul who models this now in his own life and tells him, I have been praying for you. Listen, think about this. If Jesus, the very Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior, if He is praying to the Father about people. And the Apostle Paul, who is sinful but redeemed through faith in Christ, is praying for people and one of the men that we consider to be heroes of the faith. How much more then do you think you and I should maybe be praying for people? I mean, if Jesus has to do this, and is to do this, and wants to do this, and we are his followers, and we're supposed to become like him, Maybe we should consider that we need to be praying for people more than we do. So Paul puts out in Ephesians, it's one of the places where he says, I've been praying for you. Uh, One of the other places that he's kind of on the other side of the coin now, if we can put it in that term, is in like in Romans chapter 12 and Romans 15. He now writes the church in Romans says, will you pray for me? Will you be praying for me? So Paul understands that he's supposed to be praying for individuals. He's supposed to be praying for churches. He's supposed to be praying for groups of people. He's he's talking to the Lord, asking for his blessing, will and purpose, uh, for his healing, uh, whatever the need is for people. And then Paul himself also understands, listen, I'm a man, and I need people, believers, praying for me. And he sends him out a request. Would you pray for me? The book of Colossians, chapter 4, Paul recommends to the church in Colossae, to the Colossians. He says, I want to commend someone to you. He says, I want to commend Epaphras to you. I want to commend this man to you because I have seen something. I have watched him diligently labor earnestly for you in prayer. He says, I am commending to you this man. He comes with this kind of credential. I have seen it with my own eyes. I have watched him labor, work, struggle, take time, 
take effort. Do what's hard for your behalf, on your behalf to seek God's blessing for you. I commend to you Epaphras because of his life of intercession and prayer for you. Somehow, God values prayer. Jesus models praying, the ministry of prayer. Paul models the praying for the believers. He also models that he is a believer and he needs prayer. Here we are gathered together at New Life Church this morning, wanting to be the living church here on earth where we live. How much do you and I pray for people? Just something for you to reflect on as we walk through this this morning. You know, the book of Ephesians, Paul writes, and and in chapter 6, we know chapter 6, it kind of, you know, when you say Ephesians 6, people kind of right away go to this segment of the chapter where it's about spiritual warfare and we get to put on the armor of God and and the passage goes through the armor of God or what we call the armor of God and, uh, you know, all the different parts of the armor and what they mean and it just kind of really focuses our attention. But on the heels of that section of the chapter, Paul writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All of this now with... All prayer and and petition, he says. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit with this in view. In other words, as you're praying, keep this in mind. Be alert with all perseverance and petition or supplication for the saints. You know what a petition is, don't you? You've probably had this happen. Uh, somebody shows up at your door, they knock on the door, you answer, and they got a clipboard and they've got sheets of paper. And they say, we're going around getting signatures uh, for this petition. And they tell you what the petition is and you, you make a choice. Oh, I agree with that. Um, I support that. Let me sign my name. And so they collect a list of names. We've had them from time to time here in the church. You know, it's on a pro-life issue or something like that. And people get to sign it if they want. And we send it off. And it's a petition. And it goes before those who make decisions. And they look at the petition. Well, here's something that you and I as believers get to sign, but the way we put our signature to it is by prayer. I'll give you an example. Um, Mary Oswald, a few weeks ago or so, she finally got the call. She was on the waiting list for a kidney transplant. And many of you know her. Some of you are familiar with the name because we have prayed for her, her during services recently. And uh, she has gone through this transplant. Um, she's walking around with spare parts, basically. She has three kidneys. <laughs> you know, they didn't take the one out. They just added another one. And, uh, and for, in some cases, that's, that's the best thing to do for compatibility and et cetera, without getting bogged down in all the medical stuff because a lot of that's just too marvelous and wonderful for me to comprehend. But uh, I've met with Mary, I've talked with Mary, we prayed with Mary, all those things. She, she by the way, um, she wasn't just home to visit, they sent her home two days ago on Friday. <laughs> Praise the Lord. She is doing so well. I mean, she's got a lot to do and a lot to take care of, so we need to keep praying for Mary. But when you first heard her name and what was going on, it was... I've been praying for her. We're going to pray for her. And now as you left this place and you continued to pray for her as you thought about her and included her on your prayer list if you have one, as you prayed for her, it was all of us together putting our name on this petition to God. Mary Oswald, healing, compatibility of the kidney that her numbers would be right, that she would be healthy, that however you prayed for her, for her blessing, every time you said, Lord, look it, my name's on this petition for Mary. Lord, we br- I'm bringing this petition before you. We as a church body, we have been praying for Mary. Lord, we as a church body and other believers and other places who know her have been praying for her. Lord, 
Look at the petition. We want her to be healed. We want her to be healthy. We want you to strengthen her soul and her spirit. We want you to continue to use her for your glory. Raise her up as a testimony of your power and goodness and favor. And however you pray, it's here's this petition. I've put my prayer to it. I, you know, I'm, my name's on it. It's we bring everything in this petition and an individual prayer to the Lord. It is part of what fuels and continues to be a part of this full armor of God. It's not without prayer. Are we praying for one another? You know, James chapter 5, one of the places where it says, if you're sick, call for the elders and let them pray over you. Let them pray over you. We're supposed to be praying for one another. You know, let me ask you something. I want you to raise your hands when, this, when it applies to you. Are there people in this room that you have shared a meal with at, le- at least one time, whether at a restaurant or at home? Okay. How many in, in this room... Um, you have shopped with someone in this room or in the, in the church. Maybe they're in first service. You've shopped with them. Okay. Um, how many of you have golfed with somebody in this room? Okay. How many of you have volunteered with somebody in this room to do something in ministry or in the community or something? You, you've volunteered with them. You've worked with them on something. Okay, good. Excellent. Um, husbands and wives. Um, you have shared in raising your children together. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Some of you couples, only one person raised their hand. Yeah, that's well, you know, hey. Hey, it, you know, it is what it is. Um, change it, but anyhow. Um, how many of you in this room have shared money with somebody? All right, quickly, look around who those people are who share money. No, I'm kidding you. <laughs> Um, you've done a lot of things with a lot of people in this room and outside this room. How many of you have done something with somebody in this room? <laughs> Put your hand up. Okay. Some of you are not raising your hand. You really get the need to get connected. <laughs> okay. You are an island to yourself. You need to stop that. You need to float on into shore and get connected. Um, We've done a lot of things with a lot of people. Have you prayed with them? Thank you, dear. Oldest daughter of mine. Married. Has two children outside the womb. (laughs) Those of you who don't know, she has one in the womb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks for thinking of dad. Do you love me more than your husband? No, I'm kidding. You. I'm kidding. <laughs> He's up there in the, the sound booth. I'm going to be careful. He could turn my sound off right now. I can see it. I see him chatting with the video guy right now. They're saying, hey, throw up some funny stuff on his face or images, whatever. Uh, idiot. Yeah, right. Um, have you prayed with them? I mean, I know a lot of you as parents, you're trying to model your faith to your children, uh, even if they're children who aren't living in your home anymore. And you do a lot of Christian things. And you do a lot of things with them. Have you prayed with them? I mean, you go to their ball games and you practice with them in the yard. Or you do their, your homework for them, or I mean, they're... Are you with them? Sometimes it's just simpler to build the toothpick bridge yourself. You know what I mean? (laughs) I mean, they end up with glue all over their fingers and everything sticking to it. If you haven't done that project yet with your kids, (laughs) now that's something to post on Facebook, let me tell you. That's a riot. Um, You do all these things. 
But have you prayed with them? Have you prayed for them? Have you asked them to pray for you? I mean, Jesus models this. The Apostle Paul models it. The early church models it. It's in his word. And understand that this isn't just a good idea or some philosophy. This is supposed to be an outward action that we involve ourselves in because of an inward faith that we have discovered that comes through him and through his word. Your wife gets sick. I don't mean necessarily terminal. I mean she gets sick. Have you prayed for her? Your child gets sick. They're kneeling on the bathroom floor with the lid up. Put the lid up. (laughs) Step one. You're holding a washcloth on their forehead or you're holding your daughter's hair back. And you're going through this with them. But did you pray for them? You do a lot of things with a lot of people. But do you pray with them? Jesus himself prayed for people in his life. As did the Apostle Paul, as did others. Epaphras, seeking God for the blessing to be upon someone else. I mean, we want to be the living church on earth, but are we praying for one another? By name, the church in general? Are we praying for one another? You know, it's an outward expression of an inward faith that we know to do is the right thing. So let me share with you what you and I are about to do in this room. You see, doing church here, if I can use that phrase, we want to do things that are culturally right. You don't want to violate that. But we need to do things, first and foremost, biblically. And there's a value and a precedent set by Jesus himself about praying for one another. And it's not just when you're together, because I know that you and I can pray for each other when we're apart from each other. That's the beauty of, uh, it's one of the beauty of missions, You know, we can send money, but that missionary we may not know personally and we may never get to their part of the world where God has called them or know the people they minister to, but we know God and we can be here where we live and pray to him for an outpouring of his spirit uh, for that place somewhere else around the globe, for that missionary, for the missionary's family, for his leadership teams, for converts, for... Whatever, And we can pray for each other out of each other's presence, and we should be. But there's also a time by Scripture where we pray together. We do a lot of things with a lot of people. We do a lot of things with each other. But are we praying together? 